Hello, hello, and welcome again to our podcast on the Beatles, which is called Things We Said Today. This is our weekly show that focuses mainly on what's going on in the world of the Beatles newswise. I'm Ken Michaels, known for my syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, being joined by my co-host for the program, Mr. Beatles examiner himself, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. On today's show, we've got a special guest on the phone with us. It's Bill King. He is the editor for Beatle Fan Magazine. And the reason why we have Bill on is because Beatle Fan just celebrated a major milestone, which is their 200th issue. So first of all, congratulations to Bill, and uh, we welcome Bill to our program. Well, thank you. I'm uh, glad to be joining you. Uh, first of all, let's just start with uh, a very simple question. What made you? What gave you the idea to start Beetle Fan? Well, Beetle Fan was one of those magazines where basically I started a magazine I wanted to read. Back in the day, uh, we started it in 1978, and there were a few Beatles fanzines, but they were pretty amateur efforts and came out very sporadically. And I always kept wanting someone to do a, a Beatles magazine that was done like a professional news magazine. Hmm. No one else was doing it, so my wife and I decided we would. Okay, and if I remember correctly, because back in 1982 when I started doing my radio program, I used to rely heavily on Beatle fans as well as other fanzines for my news. And it was a different time back then because issues only came out once every few months for most of these fanzines, and whereas now we have the Internet, we have Beatles Examiner and lots of other sources. But you were just talking about the other fanzines at that time, and from what I recall, there was uh, Good Day Sunshine. There was one called Strawberry Fields well, actually, Forever. Actually, uh, Good Day Sunshine came along after us. Uh, at that time, the, the main ones were Strawberry Fields Forever, which Joe Pope started mm -hmm. and I think uh, was one of the earliest. And there was The Right Thing, which Barb Fennick did. Right. right. And there were a couple of smaller ones that were basically focused just on individual Beatles. How, right. how often did you publish in the, in the early days, Bill? Uh, we've always published the main magazine six times a year, and that's still what we do. And then okay. uh, a few... A few years later, we added Beetle Fan Extra uh, as a supplementary, supplementary uh, newsletter. And then, you know, we have uh, basically now we have, you know, the Facebook page and, and Twitter and, you know, lots of different ways of, of spreading information to people. What kind of deadlines did you have? I mean, as, a, as somebody who's worked in the, in the print medium myself, I mean, I know what, you know, I know how deadlines go. What kind of deadlines did you have for the paper? When, when we started it, uh, the challenge was, of course, that the way you got, uh, the way you found out about uh, what was happening around the world was people sent in clippings or news reports. So you had to rely on international mail. And so sometimes, you know, it would be weeks before uh, people would, would uh, find out about things. And now, of course, it's, it's fairly instantaneous. Right. Uh, but uh, it, it, we often uh, would go right up till the very last minute uh, squeezing news in. And then the, the most infamous uh, case where we had to basically throw the deadline out was we, when we were working on what would have been our second anniversary issue and John Lennon was killed. Mm -hmm. And the issue was about uh, oh, well, two-thirds, three-quarters of the way finished. And we decided, well, we've got to do you know a special Lennon issue. And so we basically just crashed one. We, we, we sent out mailgrams which, because this is pre-email days, hmm. we sent out mailgrams to Al Sussman and, and various uh, contributors, you know, asking for, you know, Wally Pedrozic, asking for whatever they wanted to write. People, you know, rushed stuff to us by express mail. And uh, in, in a two-week period, we, we got a special issue out, which was uh, the first fanzine tribute to Lennon. And actually, aside from, you know, like time and... and uh, people, uh, one of the first you know, London tribute issues of any sort to get out. Did you, did you use, um, I assume you used cold type in those days, uh, for people who don't know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, because uh, before Beetle Fan, almost all, well, Bert, I think all uh, of the fanzines I saw before Beetle Fan were basically done on typewriters. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were the first uh, professionally typeset. And the way that came about was a, a college friend of ours, had bought 
uh, typeset. It was uh, the old CompuGraphic uh, typesetting equipment for a weekly <laughs> newspaper venture that quickly went bust. But he still had the typesetting equipment. And my wife had done some typesetting as sort of a, a, a summer job uh, when she was in college. And so basically we rented time on the typesetting machine, and, and we would, she would do the typesetting, and then I would paste it up, and we'd take it to the printer. <laughs> Those were the days. Um, yeah. Wow. You were talking. Of course, now, of course, it's all you know, done on you know, desktop, and, and we give PDFs to the printer. Ah, okay. You were talking before about wanting Beetle Fan to be a more professional magazine. In terms of content-wise, what did you try to do to differentiate it from the other fanzines? Well, one advantage I had was that uh, my job at the time was being the rock music critic for the Atlanta Constitution, which meant I had access to all the music labels and, and their PR people and and the information sources. Hmm. So basically the, the big difference was that instead of just uh, reprinting what, you know, was published elsewhere or publishing, you know, unconfirmed rumor, we treated it like a regular news publication would. We would, you know, confirm things as best we could and, and get information, do, do, you know, our own interviews. The, the first issue, uh, you know, I was an interview I did with Joe English, who had uh, recently uh, left Wings and, and returned to Georgia. And uh, so that, you know, was sort of got, got us off to a good start. That's always been one of the high watermarks for Beetle Fan is, is your journalism standards. Um, because, you know, and, and, you know, the fact that, that you were a professional, well, you are still, I, I just, I haven't, I, I, to be honest, I, I'm not sure. Are you still, are you still working for the Constitution, Bill? Yes, uh, it's it's uh, now the Journal Constitution. They merged the two papers uh, right. a few years back. But yes, I'm I'm still uh, I'm I'm a story editor and a blogger for the uh, AJC, as we call it. Well, congratulations for sticking with that. I mean, for staying. I, I am, yes, <laughs> through all the buyouts and everything that have taken place, I'm I'm now the senior newsroom employee. <laughs> been there, been there, done. That. I I know what that I know what that's like. Believe me. Yeah. Um, and but uh, congratulations because yeah. it's been it's been tough with newspapers uh, the past few years and uh, the people who um, have been able to uh, stick with it are, are you know are very very fortunate so I congratulate you for that. Well, um, thanks. How did you balance your time for working on Beetle Fan? At, you know, with especially in the early days with your work as a critic. Well, it was basically um, all my all of our spare time went into. You know our our side venture, which was Beetle Fan. I mean, we had both had full time jobs, and then mm-hmm. nights and weekends were spent doing Beetle Fan, and that really got interesting when we started having a family. That, that's when we had to really get you know. But fortunately, the longer we did it, the more organized we got, and the better we were able to manage that time. And plus, we had more more contributors, more helpers, you know, more people uh, providing information, and so. And in in a in a way, the once the internet arrived, that sort of simplified it some. In that, you know, we were no longer having to deal with you know getting you know dispatches sent by mail and having to key in every you know every article ourselves, you know, from hard copy. So that that allowed some time savings. Do you happen to know, just based on any kind of uh, research that you've done with your with your readers? Whether they turn to Beetle Fan mainly for, for the news, for reviews, or for retrospective pieces, have you gotten any kind of feedback like that through the years? I well, initially in the early years, the news was probably the driving force, but you know they always wanted all of that. Um, hmm. I think probably now you you would tend to think that the news is is less of a driving force because of course news is available you know on the internet. You know, like I said, almost instantaneously. But we find actually that the the news roundup still uh, is a very high interest to people because a lot of people simply don't have the time to follow, even with the internet, they don't have the time to follow, the, you know, all the comings and goings and and activities of of the the Beatles and related people, and and they like just having somebody else do it for them. 
you know, and present it to them in a nice package uh, mm-hmm. and, and sort of wade through the rumor and, and say, okay, this is what, you know, is really happening. But the, the interviews and the retrospectives and the reviews have always been a, a, a real favorite of people and, and still are. You really I think, have... I think perhaps now probably that, that is more of the, the sort of reason for us to exist than the news is. But the news is surprisingly still a, a big factor. Yeah. It's interesting that you brought that up because not everybody has the time, really, to go looking on websites every single day to find out what's happening. Exactly. So, uh, you know, you provide a service right there, but in order for Beatle Fan to survive, kind of like what you said, you have to have all those elements packaged together. Yeah, I mean, if it was just the news, I'm sure that we probably would not still be around because it would be a fairly small number of people that, you know, were, were willing to subscribe just for the news. So yeah, the interviews uh, is is a big thing, and 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 so are the reviews and and the and the sort of the retrospectives and opinion pieces. Uh, I mean, over the years, we've developed quite a, a core of of contributors uh, who have their various areas of expertise. Right. Can you mention some of the some of the contributors, the regular contributors? Sure, sure. Well, one of our our longest standing ones is uh, has actually not been with us that much in the last year, and that's Al Sussman who uh, was our original New York correspondent, and he's been doing a book. So uh, he's only oh, done really? a couple of pieces in the last year. He's working on a book on basically the so the 100 days from Kennedy's death to uh, the Beatles uh, arriving. That, that's, that sort of really? period, yeah, late 63, early 64, and, and what all was happening in the world. Wow, um, I, I wasn't I wasn't worried that that's wonderful. Yeah, Alice, yeah. Alice told uh, me about that. So yeah. Al is a long long standing contributor. Um, we Wally Pedrazic was one of our early supporters and still writes for us. Uh, and he, of course, uh, you know, is one of the uh, foremost uh, pop culture historians uh, mm-hmm. in the Beatles field. And then Alan Cozen, who writes for the New York Times, has uh, okay. written for us for years and provided a lot of interviews, including with like Paul and Ringo, and Rick Glover, uh, who uh, lives here in Atlanta uh, and is sort of the original fan on the run. Uh, Rick uh, mm-hmm. uh, has seen over 100 McCartney concerts and, and pretty close to that with Ringo. R- Rick sort of uh, is provides our ardent uh, fan uh, viewpoint. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. I, I've known Alan since before, I, well, since from way back, from the early days of the internet, we were on this internet group together. I don't know if he ever told you about it, but um, he used to pass on little tidbits of information about uh, about things. And I remember him mentioning one time that the uh, um, uh, the name of the McCartney album that I'm t- trying to think of the one off the top of my head, um, the the one where uh, it was named after the the Lennon uh, the the phrase that Lennon coined, Flaming Pie. Flaming Pie, yeah. yeah, yeah. He he revealed that to all of us. It had just come out, and uh, nobody had known that. We were the first ones to know. And Alan, that was Alan's thing. He he told us all about that, and he used to tell us some great stuff back in those days. Those were yeah, I mean, and, and you know, the fact that we had people like Alan Cozen and uh, you know Rip Rance, who mm-hmm. uh, is a longtime uh, Rip- Los Angeles area uh, newspaper man, people like that who you know were professional journalists. Uh, who wanted to contribute to the magazine, has, I think has always been uh, one of our strong suits. Rip did a great article way back when, when he was working for the Herald Examiner, or I, I think, it, yeah, I think he was working for the Herald Examiner at the time on the BBC sessions. And he was Yes, I, I think it was a series, actually. Yes, it was. It was. And I remember, I remember paying quite a bit of money to get co- copies, not copies of the paper, but copies of the series itself. Just to have it, and uh, yeah, that was a that was a, a landmark, that was a landmark thing, and I I wrote about that a few years ago, and he he and uh, yeah, it was a great that was a great series that he did. But one one of the gratifying things has been over the years we've developed new writers, younger writers. Um, Brad Hunt, who handles a lot of our book reviews, was came he he came into our circle sort of in the '80s when he was a college student. Uh, at Georgia State University, though he's actually from the Midwest, and that's where he moved back to. But that's how we met. And then, 
in the nineties we got Kit O'Toole who oh, yeah. volunteered mm-hmm. to, to do our internet coverage and she has uh become a, a frequent reviewer and, and uh a writer for us. And we're always I mean, right now, uh for the next issue we've we're planning some pieces on the sort of the releases from the spring of nineteen seventy three. And uh, we've got a college student who is working in our office on weekends, and she wants to be a writer. And she's an ardent Beatles fan, even though she's only like 19, 20 years old. And she's going to write uh, sort of the millennials' view of Red Rose Speedway and uh, living in the material world. Hey, you're talking my year there, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, I was going to say, Bill, how did the? Uh, I mean, this is kind of an obvious question, but how the internet changed? everything well a, it used to be when i was uh, compiling the news roundup i would be going through a stack of clippings and and letters and articles you know about a foot deep and now basically it's it's all uh, either has been on on the web or e- in emails to us and that's mm-hmm. how we also we get our articles now people just email them to us you know send in word attachments or or just in the emails, and and so that eliminated all of the typesetting, uh, which was a tremendous uh, relief. Oh yeah, um, and like I said, it's all you know now. Uh, basically, we we take a, a thumb drive, you know, with PDFs on it to the printer, so there's no no more you know hours spent over a light table pasting the uh, issue up. It's all <laughs> done online. I mean, on on a computer. So uh, it, it, yeah, drastically changed uh, the process. Bill, since we're looking back now at 200 issues, are there any articles that you can pinpoint that got the greatest response from uh, from well, your fans? Whenever we had an interview with uh, one of the Beatles, particularly uh, McCartney, those those drew tremendous response. We broke the international news uh of the uh Threedle sessions for free as a bird uh we had the very the very first word of that and got quoted you know it got picked up by the new york times by newsweek and uh i got you know calls from london newspapers and all that was that was a big one in terms of individual articles i did an interview a few years back with uh phil ramone uh about his work with mccartney that uh through a lot of interest. I did a piece, uh, I went back uh, through uh, contemporary sources at the time to look at, uh, you know, whether there was ever any chance that the breakup might not have happened based on what they were saying actually at the time. And that is uh, a piece that probably uh, is, is one of our readers' favorites, it's known as Unity Through Diversity. It was from a quote uh, by George Harrison in which he outlined how the Beatles might continue, you know, to get together every few years and, and do an album, you know, but go on and have their individual uh, solo careers. This, of course, uh, you know, all of would have been predicated on they had not had the business falling out over Alan Klein. Right. That, you believe, was the primary cause of the breakup? Yeah, I think that, that uh, the, the track that, that George laid out would have worked, sort of a Genesis type of arrangement, uh, had they not had a falling out over Klein. Uh, I think that that was what basically, you know, caused Paul to want to basically to extricate himself financially from the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and had it not been for that, I think, we, you know, we would have had, you know, four solo careers and then every four or five years a Beatles album would have, would have certainly been a, uh, a workable concept. And I think they, they all would have, you know, uh, gotten into that uh, had, had they not had the falling out. That's a, that's so, very interesting. I don't think I've ever heard that before. Um, so you think it, you think that could have happened despite the artistic differences and and uh, just the growing up of the Beatles and having well, marriages? Yeah, because and, I think that that having being able to do their own solo things would have solved that problem. I mean, they wouldn't have felt like George wouldn't have felt constrained, you know, because he he would have had his own albums and and same with John and 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 Paul and and of course Ringo. Um, I think would have gone along either way, you know. But uh, yeah, I, I think it could have worked. I mean, there have been other groups, you know, where it has worked, where that sort of arrangement has worked, where they <laughs> they get together every few years, you know. And other than that, they're they're they have their own solo bands. Hmm. That's amazing. Although the Paul has said that there were times when John was still alive that they were approached, and there'd always be one of them that would be against it. 
Yeah, I mean, and that got into the old uh, power, the sort of the power play situations, you know, where uh, I, I once was was talking with the attorney for one of them, and he said, "Yeah, he said the problem always was you'd get a yes from all of them, and then the first guy who had said yes would suddenly say, well, no, you know, because everybody wanted to have the last word." Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, they had that long and winding road thing, you know, sitting uh, idea for years, and you know, it just never, I mean, it never just worked out. Which, you know, is, I mean, I uh, think the fact that they did get together, you know, for the anthology, you know, uh, shows that that it was it was capable of happening. And and I think had John been alive, he would have been on board with the anthology. Yeah, I, I, I you know, I think so too. I think so too. Can you remember your most controversial article, Bill? The one that got the was there ever one that got a real angry reaction? Well, in the early years, just basically album reviews because it was sort of people expected people. A lot of people came to the fanzine with the expectation that it's a fanzine, so you're going to love everything. Mm-hmm. And we didn't approach it that way. Our our reviews, you know, were written, you know, like you would for any publication. So right. If it was a subpar album, we would say so. And Al Sussman, in particular, got George Harrison fans riled up in the late 70s with some of his reviews. So I think that was uh, probably the, the most controversial thing. Yeah, Which Al- album in particular? Somewhere in England. Yeah, somewhere in England, uh, that, that period. Um, I mean, basically, and all, all along the way, I mean, whenever uh, there was an album that we didn't think was really their best work, I mean, and we'd say so, we'd get a lot of flack from people who were like, hey, you're a Beatles fan, why are you knocking them? You know, and we're like, right. we're not knocking them, we're just simply saying this isn't their best work. Yeah, I've, I've run into that too, where you know people you know, expect you to be over the top for everything that they've done, and you know, it's, that's just not going to happen. But Yeah, I mean, if, if, you, you know, if, if you don't take an honest, critical approach to things, then basically your opinion ceases to have any value. Right. Exactly. Well, yeah. I, I happen to like most of the solo music myself. Not every single song, but I genuinely enjoy most of it. So well, we do too. I mean, it, but you know, even doing, even enjoying most of it, you know, you know, there's some albums better than others, and there's right. there's the occasional track where you sort of wince and and think, why did he do that? You know. Yeah, and I'm I'm probably actually about fifty percent on the solo stuff, whereas the group stuff obviously. You know, it is a, is a lot better in, in, in my mind. But you know, I mean, that's part and that's, of it. And I think that's a, a natural result of the fact that you know the group was you know you were getting the best. I mean, mm-hmm. they, oh, they yeah. basically if they didn't all like it, they didn't put it out. Right. Right. Exactly. But exactly. You know, but it's it's a different reaction when you've got solo music because it's not the same thing as having a group. It's it's really uh, maybe more the artist has more freedom to do whatever he wants to do and experiment instead of having the format of a group. Exactly. You know, oh, it's, sure, and that's, it's a that's different. A plus. I mean, it's a different that, feel. That, you know, Paul can do his electronic music and can do the the mashups and and you know his fascination with dance music. Yeah, I mean those things he probably would not have been able to do within the confines of the Beatles. Right. Mm-hmm. But some people might oh. find that more interesting. It well, all depends and, and upon more power to them, you know. Yeah. I mean, and 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 we've certainly had you know reviews. I mean, uh, we've I've I've gotten flack from people when I liked something and they didn't. I mean, we were very positive about Paul's album last year, the Standards album. Right. There were people generally either loved that album or they hated it. Right. Now I do remember Al Sussman, who's been a frequent guest on my shows through the years. He got um, a lot of flack for giving a bad review to somewhere in England. Because at mm-hmm. the time, he thought that George was kind of putting out the same old stuff, and I think he referred to him as a boring old fart <laughs> in, mm. in the article. So, uh, you know, you can, you can see it's, it's understandable how some fans probably would overreact to that. Oh, sure. And, and, but you gotta, and, and we also, you know, e- even when we ran pieces like that, I mean, we quite often would run two reviews of an album if we had, you know, someone who was very you know, strongly against something, and other people liked it a lot, well, we'd run both viewpoints. Interesting. Mm. Wow. So where will the magazine go? Uh, where do you see the magazine heading now, um, you know, after 200 issues? Are you you're going to keep... Um, 
as, as long as people want it and and we're able to, we'll keep publishing. Um, you know, whether that will still be a, a print magazine in five years, who knows? I mean, it just depends on the economics of, of publishing. Uh, it's entirely possible that we might end up, you know, having to, you know, deliver it electronically if, if it just reaches the point where it's not sustainable, you know, to keep printing and mailing a magazine. Mm-hmm. But as long as I, I'm I'm a dinosaur in in terms of journalism, so as long as it is sustainable to keep printing and mailing a magazine, we will. Okay. Well, you can do both. Yeah, I mean it, that may well you know evolve. I mean, basically, one of the limitations is, of course, that it is a part time thing. It's something we do on the side. It, I don't do it as a living. If if I did, you know, we probably would have a podcast, you know, or, you know, mm-hmm. and various other things that I simply don't have time to deal with. Right. Well, you can always, to make the print version survive, you can always put certain features in there that's not available on the Internet. Well, I mean, that's to make how that we attractive. basically have always done. Our, our website is, is strictly a promotional website, you know, and, and we do have Beetle Fan Plus, you know, uh, pages that, that people have to pay to subscribe to. But yeah, we've we've never we we fortunately did not follow the the route that a lot of newspapers did, which was just put it all on the web for free and right. and you know you can sell advertising. Well, that wasn't a workable model as it turned out, and thank goodness we didn't follow it. Uh, we goodness. always basically said if you want the magazine, you have to subscribe to it. Which which uh, makes you smarter than a lot of newspaper uh, at least one uh, newspaper executive I know personally. <laughs> Hmm. Quite a few of them, actually. Uh, yeah, true. <laughs> so, and well, and of course, there there are now you know now the big thing in newspapers is paywalls. You know, I mean, they're all right. now trying to put up the paywalls and figure out how are we going to get paid for this stuff. Mm-hmm. Are you looking at? Uh, I mean, Beetlefan.com dot com is still free. You're not. Mm-hmm. Gonna, are you going to do anything to? go along that route or you know maybe well it, it basically that would you know if if the mailing and printing of the magazine was no longer a workable model then yeah we might move it online and and make it a pay site but or at least make parts more you know more of it a pay site how that works out i don't know i mean we're just we sort of are taking it as it comes okay all right well you sort of highlighted some of the the um major moments in the history of Beetlefan. Is there one that you would say is your proudest? Your proudest achievement? I would say it would be between the John Lennon special tribute issue and breaking the news about uh, Free as a Bird. Um, but, and and, and another, another sort of personal proud moment was when someone who visited Paul McCartney and was in his library was looking at his bookshelves and found Beetlefan on on Paul's <laughs> shelf. Uh, that, wow, that's sort of a, a nice moment. Yeah. yeah, that is that is pretty nice. That is that is very nice. That's got to so, mean something. That's real special, right there. Did you ever yeah. hear from any of the Beatles or any of their representatives what they thought of the fanzine, other than knowing that Paul had that that book? Um, not directly uh, as such. I mean, uh, Ringo's publicist. Uh, you know, knows us well and has contacted us, you know, uh, asking for this. That. And, and, and the guy that used to run his tours used to, you know, contact us and ask for, you know, information and all. So, I mean, they're, they're aware of us, but, and Rick Glover, ha- in his encounters with McCartney, has definitely gotten the impression that Paul was aware of, of things we've done. But no, we have not actually had a you know like you know a letter from Paul or or you know Ringo say oh yeah you know I love Beetle Fan or anything. Uh, hasn't hasn't Paul acknowledged Rick from the stage? Uh, yes, at he the has. Yeah. 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 How can I you remember, not? <laughs> How yeah, can well, you yeah, not? I think uh, uh, most uh, when he when he attended his 100th concert, Paul made mention from the stage. <laughs> That's, That's amazing. How many yeah, shows so, he's been to? <laughs> I know. Yeah. So uh, maybe you should just let the folks know, uh, Bill, if they want to subscribe to Beetle Fan the old-fashioned way, um, what is your address, and give them the information on that. Okay. Well, uh, you can subscribe. It's uh, six issues a year. Uh, it costs $30.50 or $35 if you want it sent first class in an envelope. Uh, that's in the United States. And, and if you check uh, Beetlefan.com, you can get rates for uh, anywhere else. 
And our address is P.O. Box 33515, Decatur, Georgia, 30033. And like I said, you can check out Beetlefan.com and also on Facebook, um, just search Beetlefan and we'll come up. And you can get the information there, too. Okay. And if you want to get in touch with us, Steve, there's a number of ways people can get in contact with you. Uh, they can email me at beetlesexaminer at gmail.com. Um, I'm on Facebook under my name, and I have pages for all my my uh, columns, uh, including my brand new, this is un- unrelated, but I, I am now Monkey's Examiner. <laughs> and you're, um, you're everything on the Internet I'm now. Er- I'm everything. I'm everything. Um, but anyway, uh, beetlesexaminer at gmail.com is the way to get a hold of me. So... Before we end, I want to say, Bill, congratulations on the on the 200 issues, and we hope you keep it going for as long as you can. Um, so, well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. And and uh, let me throw out also my email if if anybody wants to contact me. Sure. Beetlefanmagazine at gmail dot com uh, is a good way, and uh, I'll, I'll be glad to you know answer any questions uh, they have. Yes, okay. and likewise, Bill. Congratulations. We send a high five out to you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and um, is this in any way inspiring you to start Monkey Man? I mean, Monkey <laughs> Fan? <laughs> uh, we actually, uh, a few years back, had a, a another publication called Anglophile. I remember uh, that. I remember yeah, that. Uh, that all, and and, and uh, we did that uh, for quite a few years, about 10 years. Um, now it's, it's basically evolved into just a, a blog and a Facebook page because it basically was just too much. Uh, we, weren't, mm. we weren't able to to keep it going just cause time-wise. I remember uh, yeah. article. I remember articles in that on the Prisoner and the Avengers. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah. Both, I, both of which I I still am big fans of. So yeah, I remember that very well. Yeah. Hmm. I said Monkey Man before because I was thinking about what uh, John Lennon used to call Mickey Dolan's. Right. Right. But anyway, if any of you would like to get in contact with me, you can write to me at everylittlething at att.net. You can also look at my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. Find out where you can hear my syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing. And you can also check out the live broadcast of Every Little Thing, which is on WNHU. Wednesday evenings from 8 to 10, just go to wnhu.net. That's 8 to 10 Eastern Standard Time. Oh, and I was going to say you can hear this show on uh, iTunes. You can hear it on podbean.com, and uh, and we have a page on the on Facebook for it too. So, any number of ways you can hear our pro- program and get in contact with Steve and myself. Right. Okay. So, Bill, thanks so much for joining us. Congratulations again. And Thank you. Uh, on behalf of things we said today, I'm Ken Michaels saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. See you next time. See you next time. Ha, <laughs> ha,